for watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. Attack on America. This is News 6 Network continuing coverage. And here at News 6, we are continuing to follow this attack on America. We will be monitoring CBS Network, and we will go back to them if any new information becomes available. We want to tell you how today's tragic events are affecting us here in Richmond. A lot has happened to get us to this point. It began at 8.48 this morning as 50,000 people were going to work at the World Trade Center. An American Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles is hijacked and has flown into one of the towers. A short time later, 9.03 a.m., a United Airlines flight, also Boston to L.A., flies into the other tower. Forty minutes later, 9.43 a.m., 200 miles south, a Dulles flight to Los Angeles flies into a helipad at the Pentagon. Back in New York, at 10.05, the most recognizable symbol of New York and perhaps the country crumbles to the ground. Twenty minutes later, 10.28, the North Tower, also a pile of rubble. Then, it's not over yet. At 10.48 a.m., a United flight from Newark bound for San Francisco crashes to the ground in southern Pennsylvania, southeast of Pittsburgh. In all, four hijacked planes, 266 on board. Well, as word of the attack spread, one Richmond mother's first thoughts turned to her son, who works in the World Trade Center. Reba Hollingsworth had the chance to talk with her. Reba, I can't imagine what she must have been feeling. You're right. Betty Williams actually watched the events unfold on television this morning. Now, she called our station asking us if we can help her find out if her son was okay. Her worst fear was her son was trapped inside. Masters from Columbia University. Betty Williams smiles proudly as she speaks about her son, Craig. He's a rising businessman for Merrill Lynch. His New York office is inside the World Trade Center. His mother watched the attack unfold on television. I don't know what to think. You know, my baby, I don't know if that's a building he's in. You know, nobody will tell me anything. Mrs. Williams had a gut feeling her baby was inside. She says he works from 7 a.m. to late at night. All she could do was to sit and wonder. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. Because you have no idea if he's in there or not? No. You're just waiting to hear a word right now? I'm, I'm hoping that he's okay. I'm feeling for those other people also that are in there. Moments after this interview began, Mrs. Williams ran upstairs to see and hear the latest news information. She learned one of the towers collapsed. As you can just see that she just literally just broke down. I mean, just the thought of that your child could be inside that building and you just saw with your own eyes that that building collapsed. But there is a good news, good news out of this story. She did learn that he happened to be at another office building in New York, another Merrill Lynch building. So she was very, very fortunate. I know she was so relieved, Reba. I guess it was the fear of not knowing that yeah. was hardest on her, and so many families are yeah. dealing with that right now. And we have a lot of people here at the station, they just can't get through on the lines, cell phones or telephones. They're having problems getting through. It's going to be an agonizing wait. Yes, it is. Thanks, Reba. Back to you all. One of today's terrorist attacks happened right here in Virginia, an attack on the Pentagon in Arlington forced parts of I-95 and 395 around D.C. to close, and that backed up traffic for miles. Live at 5's Deborah Cox is in Arlington, where the U.S. Pentagon was attacked. That's right. We're actually on an alternate route from Interstate 95. Let me show you. This is actually Route 1, and what a difference a few hours can make. The traffic is moving freely. This is northbound, but just a few hours ago, both northbound and southbound were jammed packed. We're told that the police were are alternating the traffic onto 395 South, but earlier it was backed up and um, no one could get in, we're told, by Arlington police except for the FBI, the Secret Service, and medical personnel. Of course, some people who work obviously right around this area were just two miles outside the area, saw the plane take a nosedive. Like the rest of America, Virginians working less than two miles from the Pentagon are frightened by what's happened. Bobby Bell works at a car dealership and saw a plane in the sky early this morning, then heard an awful noise. The engines were just making a strange noise. And I looked, uh, I looked over this way, and I, I barely caught the end of the plane going behind those trees. And seconds after that, there was a loud explosion and a mushroom cloud had raised above the trees. 
Bell would later learn the plane hit the Pentagon. It scared me for a second, and then when I saw the, the, the mushroom cloud, I really uh, got my heart beating. Bobby Bell has worked in the area for 16 years. He still can't believe what he saw. And this is a day that's going to go down in history, and, and I don't think anybody uh, has, really knows how terrible it is yet. And, I, and uh, you know, I'll remember this day for the rest of my life. I don't think anybody can even put into words exactly how a lot of Americans are feeling at this hour. But right now you're looking at a live picture uh, just over the hill there, the trees uh, between the Holiday Inn and the red brick building. The Pentagon is just beyond that point. That's how close we're, we are. We're just two miles within the realm of the Pentagon and where this accident took place. You know, I talked to a man earlier today who worked in this vicinity who was telling me, uh, obviously shocked, obviously upset. He said, you know, the Pentagon is one of those sacred places that you think something like this would never happen, but obviously it has. Ray and Cheryl. Now, Deborah, you sat up there in traffic for quite a while uh, trying to get into the city. Uh, describe what you saw as you were sitting there waiting. Well, actually, I'll tell you, we were coming up Interstate 95, uh, the normal way to get up here, and it was free moving, uh, not hardly tr any traffic at all on 95 North, but we uh, diverted off of the roadway to come into Route 1, and that's where we encountered a lot of traffic. Obviously, everybody of the same mindset trying to get off 95 because it was blocked and traffic uh, was jam-packed at a certain section, but we uh, got off a little earlier than that and headed on to Route 1, but it was just as bad. Traffic was uh, uh, bumper to bumper, so to speak. Could you see the smoke from where you were? Actually, we could. Um, we, when we came into town, uh, I don't know the exact roadway we were coming into before we got onto Route 1, but you could see the smoke, the billow of smoke um, uh, coming up from where the Pentagon is just right over that uh, the, the, the tree line there, Cheryl. Um, it obviously is dissipated now, and I would say within the 20 minutes from when we first got here, uh, the smoke had dissipated significantly, but we could, yes, definitely see it when we first arrived on scene. We haven't heard any numbers back here as far as those injured or killed in the Pentagon. Deborah, have you heard anything at all in Northern Virginia about the uh, injuries or casualties of the Pentagon? No, actually, we're not in an area where we can talk to any officials, Ray, unfortunately. We're kind of in a business section, residential area, so we haven't been able to get any word on numbers, which is, I'm, I'm sure, a lot of people are trying to uh, gather uh, at this moment. But again, no official word from where we are. We are trying to get in contact with some of our congressmen. I've talked with a few of the PR people for Congressman Cantor and Congressman Randy Forbes. Obviously, you know, Randy Forbes sits on the House um, Armed Services Committee. Uh, we're going to try and catch up with them if we can get back into the district, but obviously we're told it's on lockdown and we're not even sure we can get in there to talk to them. But of course, we'll try. If we hear anything from them, we'll bring it to you. All right. Thank you. Deborah Cox reporting live from Northern Virginia in Arlington just near the Pentagon area. In fact, we'll talk now live to our Congressman Eric Cantor. Can you hear us okay, Congressman? Congressman Cantor? Yes. It's Ray Collins and Cheryl Miller here. All right, Cheryl. Uh, could describe the mood right now on Capitol Hill. Uh, it is really very devastating around here. We are all uh, just anticipating uh, being able to go back in and resume work in the Capitol. Obviously, this morning, uh, it was very chaotic. The Speaker issued evacuation orders for the entire Capitol and all the office buildings. So we had to evacuate very quickly. And Washington really has uh, been rocked by this, as you can see by the pictures of the Pentagon and the bellowing smoke. Uh, we see armed uh, guards in front of all the federal installations. And in fact, there's a military air cap uh, in place over Washington to ensure the safety of the airspace. So it, it really, truly is a very tense time, uh, but I think one that uh, one in which the members of Congress want to get back to work, rally behind the president, and be able to take uh, swift and, and sure action, action against these terrorists. Congressman, can you talk about, at all about the plan of alert for Washington, D.C., and the plan for I tomorrow? Can't quite hear you. But uh, it is, it is uh, a, a time that I think uh, America needs to have the families and the victims and their families and their thoughts and prayers. Uh, and certainly uh, we look forward to tomorrow uh, when uh, the leadership has said that we will go back into session and we will be debating a resolution having to do with today's events uh, and hopefully get on with the business of Congress. And ironically, 
today was the day we were going to start debating the defense authorization bill. Uh, so I believe, obviously, the tone of that debate will be much different after today's horrific events. All right. Thank you very much, Congressman. Eric Cantor for joining us live by telephone this afternoon. And back here in Richmond, Governor Gilmore declares a state of emergency for Virginia. That gave him the power to instantly mobilize military and police forces statewide. Take a look. This is video out at the Richmond International Airport where the Air National Guard was getting ready for action as the National Guard was... Uh, mobilized earlier today. Earlier today, the governor also spoke from cap our Capitol Hill. I directed all law enforcement personnel across the Commonwealth to report any unusual criminal activity that they might see in connection with any type of hostage type of issue or any type of use of firearms, any type of issues like that, to the Emergency Operations Center. Again, Governor Jim Gilmore. Now, many people turn to prayer at a time of national tragedy. This is the noon mass at the cathedral in Richmond. They had a much larger number of people at this service than normal. Many of those we talked to expressed shock and sadness. We fathomed the enormity of the situation and um, just totally shocked that something like this could happen. I was there a couple years ago, sitting on the 110th floor, having having uh, for a wedding with my for my niece there, and so we're all touched by this. It could be any one of our families. I mean, I don't understand. It's I feel very scared. I feel especially scared of what the United States may do. The bishop released this statement. This is Bishop Walter F. Sullivan. We are shocked at the devastating loss of life. Our hearts go out to the family and friends of the victims. We deplore any act of violence and terrorism. We pray for the victims of this horrible tragedy. Speaking of prayer, the cathedral will hold a service tonight at 730. It's located on Park Avenue, and many other churches and synagogues will also be holding special prayer services tonight, so you can call their offices for the exact time. Thank you, Stephanie. We have been inundated here at News 6 with phone calls from people from churches uh, saying that they are having some kind of memorial service tonight that they want to get together. It's impossible to get all of those listings on, but you may want to give a call to your church uh, mm -hmm. and, and know that there will be some kind of memorial or gathering going yeah. on in your neighborhood. A lot of vigils all over. Now, the FAA has grounded all air travel today and until at least noon tomorrow that's caused quite a problem around the country right now people not being able to get anywhere our jd carpenter is live at richmond international airport well, Ray and Cheryl, the four apparently deliver air attacks on united states as you said has affected all air travel that's quite obvious here at the richmond international airport all you need to do is look straight down the terminal and you will notice it is void of people because shortly after the attacks the faa came out and said all departing air flights across the country are canceled we were on the plane coming from Orlando to go into Newark. And they said we had to divert, it for, divert into Baltimore, which was then readjusted to Richmond. Bob Ritchie, like every other passenger in the air, has been grounded. And it was not until he landed when he found out why. At any and every monitor in the airport, passengers watched in disbelief as the full extent of the horror was revealed. Like the nation, we have put a ground stop here at Richmond International Airport until further notice. If passengers weren't glued to the monitors, they were soberly and very quietly looking for alternative ground transportation to get home. That's where Martha Olson was. She lives in the New York area. Well, I'm concerned about my friends, my children, everybody up there. Also trying to get north, pilot Emery Wheat. He was flying a corporate Learjet when commanded to land. And air traffic control came on, said there had been a major disaster in the air traffic control system, and that all aircraft must land, IFR, VFR, it didn't matter. You had to land immediately at the nearest airport. Now, some of these people are, have to go some, some up to like 200 miles, over hundreds of miles to get home, but they are not angry. They understand this is for their safety, and they also know that this allows the military to take a very aggressive stance on any airborne threat. But in the meanwhile, here at the Richmond International Airport, there is increase in security. There's an obvious police presence here, but security is basically the same, and I'm also being told that airport officials are now going over some contingency plans. Ray and Cheryl? So, J.D., you say it's pretty empty there right now, so almost everybody has either gone to area hotels or rented cars and left? That's exactly what's happening. They uh, rented cars. I was just talking to Avis, and they're almost out of cars. Just a few more left in the parking lot. All right. Thank you, J.D., live at the airport.
And of course, a lot of the problem in the air is the fact that there were four hijacked planes that were involved in this entire situation. Any air traffic that was up and flying when this all happened, a lot was diverted into Canada. A lot of the European flights were diverted back to where they came from, so they did not want anybody in the airspace as far as they could see. Really a problem there. Now, Greg McQuaid, our colleague, was flying today, flying today from Boston to Richmond, and he was caught up in all of this. Greg, at what point did you find out what was going on? Ray, the flight uh, went throughout the entire uh, time and uh, did not find out until I actually landed. I can tell you I was on a, uh, an American Airlines flight that left Boston early this morning, shortly after both flights that were subsequently hijacked and uh, crashed into the World Trade Centers. And I was roughly in New York airspace when the uh, attacks occurred, but uh, nothing was said on board. And as I said, it was only after I uh, had landed uh, that news started to filter throughout the plane and uh, here at Richmond International Airport, a lot of uh, cell phones started ringing and that's when uh, presumably a lot of passengers found out when you walked down here in the terminal you saw people huddled around televisions uh, just transfixed and uh, they basically were shell-shocked uh, as was I now to give you an indication of how busy Logan International Airport is uh, today between 7 and 9 a.m. there were 220 flights that landed and took off now here at Richmond International Airport about only 200 flights take off and land here during the day so uh, that gives you an indication of how busy it actually is. I can tell you it was very disturbing to, uh, to know that I was actually in the same terminal as the, uh, as the person or persons that were responsible for this attack. And I think it was even uh, sadder to know that uh, I was there among uh, some people that lost their lives today. Right? Yeah, Greg, you talked about being at the airport and not knowing anything once you boarded your flight and got in the air. But now looking back onto it and thinking about your time in the airport in Boston, Anything stand out now at all? Not at all, uh, uh, Cheryl. I can tell you that I have flown out of Boston's uh, Logan International Airport uh, on countless occasions during the weekday. And uh, I can tell you in Terminal B, where American Airlines is, uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of passengers. There is uh, uh, security there, uh, both security guards and state troopers uh, looking at passengers and looking uh, throughout their bags. But I can tell you it would be uh, virtually uh, impossible to weed out any sort of terrorist in the crowd. Greg, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. Did you call your loved ones back in Boston and assure them that you're okay? I certainly did. I had a, uh, a dear friend uh, pick me up here at the airport. She was uh, very uh, excited to see me, but uh, yet sad. And uh, when I called my mom, uh, who had dropped me off uh, at the airport today, uh, she was in tears, and uh, she told me that she loved me uh, many times. And uh, I can tell you, I'm just glad uh, to be on the ground. And we are, we're glad you are, too. Thank you, Greg, live at the airport. For one Richmond woman, this morning's terrorist attack on America is like reliving a nightmare. Eight years ago, Susan Carlton was inside the World Trade Center when Palestinian terrorists bombed it. She and her family got out safely, but she says watching the planes crash into the World Trade Towers in New York brought back the memories of February 26, 1993. Ain't you, you're not safe anymore where you go. I don't want to think that because America is still a great country and lots of good people, but you don't know where you're safe anymore. And Michelle King will have more on Susan Carlton's story a little later on on News 6 at 6. Obviously, all of the events of today have shaken up everybody. You don't know what to feel. Mm -hmm. You feel numb, actually, and it's just a very, very sad day for everyone. There are so many stages of grief, as some of us know all too well. I think it's still we're at the numb point, and we'll, we'll move on from there. Dr. Oliver, Oliver Hill is here from VSU, a psychologist. And what are your initial thoughts about how we as humans are reacting to today's tragedy? Well, I think numbness is probably the key word. I think everybody's feeling numb. And I think there are some residual effects of a terrorist attack. Uh, you have the primary victims, but then you have the effect of the terrorism in terms of spreading fear and uncertainty and doubt in the rest of the country. And I think it's these secondary effects of terrorism that we can do something about. We can work not to create more anxiety for ourselves, not to do the kind of anxiety producing self-talk of increasing fear and um, talking with neighbors and talking about how we're afraid to go places or to do things. I think all of us can help the situation if we start to kind of ratchet down the anxiety level instead of ratcheting up, which is the natural tendency in a situation like this. Dr. Hill, a lot of our children were already in school when these amazing pictures started to come across our television screens. How do we tell the children about what happened today? Well, I think one thing we can do also is to assure the children that they are safe. These things happen around the world. 
they're like lightning strikes. Uh, you know, they will happen, but the chances of them happening to us are very small. And what we have to protect against is this proliferation of fear. And I think talking to children, letting them know that the world, and particularly the United States, is basically a safe place. We don't have to be afraid. Um, those are the kinds of things we can talk about with our children. And we probably need to let them ask us questions and, and have some answers for them as well. Right, exactly. And to know that it's natural for them to feel these emotions. And so we don't have to bottle up our emotions either. We can experience the raw emotion, but we have to know how to combat those emotions. We have to know how to take down the level of stress, how to protect ourselves from internalizing this uh, kind of stress attack. Something that struck me watching the uh, video this morning of the plane hitting the World Trade Center, because of the entertainment industry and the action movies we see these days, we see so many horrific scenes. How has that numbed us or how has that affected us, do you think, when reality actually happens and we can't believe what we're seeing almost? Well, that is one of the things that's been studied over the years in terms of the effect of violence and uh, this kind of thing on children and on adults. And uh, it does create what could be called habituation. I mean, the more familiar we are, the more exposed we are to a particular stimulus, the less we tend to react to it. So I think in terms of the initial video of the uh, plane crashing into the building, that was almost familiar, but it was the sequence of events, the continuing uh, announcements of other bombs and the, the seeing the buildings gradually disintegrate that gradually ratcheted up the level of dread that most people were feeling. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Oliver Hill from Virginia State University, professor of psycholo and psychologist. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I heard some uh, network anchors say, folks, this is not a computer-generated image. This is actual video of what happened this morning. And th that's the hard thing. Because we are so inundated with this at the movies and on television, it's hard to look at this and actually believe it is real and going on, and people are dealing right now with this disaster. It's, it's just the kind of thing we have seen in movies the past few years, mm -hmm. uh, taking on uh, New York like that. Number of closings right now and cancellations around the area. It is very much affecting our entire country. Stephanie Roshan is standing by with a list of what has been closed and canceled today. We want to pass those on to you now, uh, Cheryl and Ray. The malls are closed tonight, all the malls, and we understand that Chesterfield Town Center is planning on being closed tomorrow. The UVA Penn State football game that was scheduled in Charlottesville has been postponed. No makeup date has been set on that. The Landmark Theater is closed, the Coliseum closed. Fort AP Hill is closed. A number of colleges have canceled classes for this evening. One we have for you, Mary Washington College, has canceled its classes for this evening. Greyhound bus has stopped service throughout much of the country. All bus service has been canceled to the northeast. A spokesman says bus service is canceled indefinitely from Richmond to many points north. Amtrak has stopped running trains to the northeast and some other areas. In Northern Virginia, the Virginia Railway Express says it's running very limited services this afternoon. Trains between D.C. and Fredericksburg are running slow, forced to go at restricted speeds. Rental car companies are swamped with requests for cars from people who want to get home. A lot of flights have been canceled. Several companies have simply run out of vehicles. People lucky enough to rent a car were driving as far as Dallas. Even those who live close to Richmond were expecting a long ride home. Well, it was a number of places I called, but um, uh, came, came here to Avis, and unfortunately, uh, uh, God opened up an opportunity for me to be able to get a car so I can get back home. In Baltimore, it's probably about two and a half hour drive. I'm expecting at least a six to eight hour drive at least, but I have to get home to my family. We understand flights across the country are canceled through noon tomorrow. Ray and Cheryl. All right, thank you, Stephanie. That's at least until noon tomorrow. What boggles my mind, among other things today, is how at four different checkpoints today, twice in Boston, once in Newark, once at Dulles, terrorists apparently, not confirmed yet, were able to get past those intense metal detectors and security. I talked to several viewers today who called in and said that they had taken flights recently, mm -hmm. one in particular from Europe, and said that he never even went through customs coming through. And really? they never checked him, nothing. So it appears that security has gotten a little bit lax, and I mm -hmm. think that is going to change dramatically after today. Yeah, I hadn't felt that. I've flown recently. I always thought it was pretty tight, but apparently your friend had a different experience. Mm -hmm. I've had a, a piece of gum in my pocket set off yeah, the sure. detectors, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know about that. Well, shifting gears just a little bit this afternoon, we do want to check in on the weather for you today. Here's our chief meteorologist, Mike Goldberg.
Ray and Cheryl, on a day like today, you certainly notice that the weather is not all that important. We do have a good forecast for you, though, for tonight. Skies will be clear. It will be comfortably cool as temperatures fall down into the 50s throughout our viewing area. And tomorrow looks like a very nice day as well. Bright sunshine. Temperatures starting on the cool side, but warming up to around 80 degrees for an afternoon high. And the extended outlook has more great weather ahead. There's another front that will be coming through here later Thursday that may spark a shower or two in northern Virginia. Otherwise, all looks pretty quiet and very cool as we head into the weekend. Daytime highs on Saturday in the low to mid 70s with overnight lows and outlying communities down into the 40s. And just when we start to get close to 80 again, another front comes through on Monday to cool us back down a few more degrees. So a little preview of fall as we head through the next couple of days. Right now, we're going to head out on the roads and check Metro traffic with Chris Dennison. Chris? Well, under the circumstances, of course, uh, downtown Richmond area, almost a ghost town at this point. A lot of folks have left early this afternoon, so no major problems at the Pell height. We have a little delay uh, back toward Forest Hill. Also, 395 has been reopened for those up toward Washington. Of course, you can't go directly into the downtown Richmond area, but at least that is available. And Interstate 95, a very good trip all the way through the downtown Richmond area. Watch out for an accident right now at Lauderdale and Park Terrace. Also one in Midtown over at Floyd and Granby. And 24th and Sims, police dealing with a run of bad luck there as well. Traffic update this afternoon is made possible by Honda. That's a look at traffic and now back to more news. All right, thank you, Chris. And we know a lot of the buildings downtown had closed earlier today. All the federal buildings shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, the Richmond Coliseum was closed for the day. The Landmark Theater is also closed for tonight. And along with the governor's declaration of a state of emergency, our city manager has also declared a state of emergency for the city of Richmond. I talked to the FBI today. They said they sent home all non-essential employees, about 30 roughly. Mm -hmm. The rest were all staying put. In fact, there was an emergency response team from the local FBI. FBI heading up to the national headquarters in Washington. How they got there is beyond me since the roads were so clogged on the way up there and of course flying in would not be a possibility. No, not today. a possibility. As no. of noon today they limited access to our city hall. Uh, public safety though, refuse collection and utility services uninterrupted and as you know they have put a heightened alert on all nuclear power plants around the country mm -hmm. and we do have several right here in this area as well so they will be tightening yeah. security there. Borders are also closed by the way talking to some friends in upstate New York and they said the Peace Bridge and other uh, access to uh, Canada, Mexico closed for now. Closed. Uh, we have to take a, a lot of alert right now. Somebody said our lives are going to change today and we're going to find out just how much in the hours and days and months and years to they come. They have changed today. In the wake of today's attacks, local emergency workers are on standby. Live at 5, Shelby Brown is live in the newsroom with the latest on that. Cheryl, the Red Cross has a disaster action team ready to jump in at a moment's notice. These volunteers have extensive training in disaster response. Meantime, dozens of volunteers are manning the phones in a Red Cross call center. This tragedy has far-reaching effects, and volunteers here in Richmond have taken tons of calls from people who, here who are panicked and in a frenzy because they can't reach loved ones in D.C. and New York. Our first concern is to administer first aid and care for those people who are right in the middle of the disaster. As soon as the immediate disaster is over, we will assist in locating and tracing loved ones, and they can call the Red Cross at that time. And for now, Red Cross officials are urging people to continue to try and reach loved ones until they can get through the critical task of assisting the injured. Keep in mind, again, the phone lines may be tied up because there are so many people trying to get through. Reporting live from the newsroom, Shelby Brown, live at 5. All right, thank you, Shelby. Another building at the World Trade Center has collapsed. Do you think there's just two buildings there? No, there's more than that. Turns out number seven in the World Trade Center complex, uh, not the landmark Twin Towers, also has collapsed. It was evacuated after this morning's plane attacks that brought down the towers and has been burning ever since. So in downtown New York, the uh, devastation is actually continuing to happen. Right. The towers that fell were World Trade Center 1 and 2. Those were each 110 stories tall. And the buildings that were burning uh, late this afternoon were 5 and 7. And as you said, mm -hmm. 7 just collapsed. And you've got, when you have two buildings of 110 stories collapsing, you know there's a lot, a lot of residual debris. And there are a lot of buildings in the area that they say are in in threat of, of collapsing themselves. They are on fire. Mm -hmm. There uh, is a lot of devastation in Manhattan right now. We have yet to even to hear. We heard one number earlier today because everyone's saying, well, how, how many were killed? We, we heard a number of 10,000, not confirmed yet, but I imagine that number is not going to stay there for long. I think the only real number that we know is the 266 people who were on those four planes that were crashed today after they were apparently hijacked. Two planes that left from Boston, uh, both were on the way to Los Angeles, as was the plane from Dulles, also on the way to Los Angeles. I saw a report of a reporter at LAX where there was many families who were initially waiting for loved ones, and of course those planes never got near arriving. The, uh, the, 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 the tragic stories continue to emerge by the minute. 
Mm, it, it is a sad, sad day for all of America. Yep. Absolutely. Let's continue our coverage now. Our Tri-Cities Bureau Chief Wayne Colville joins us now. That's right. We're uh, in Fort Lee in that area. Security extremely tight today. Absolutely, Ray and Cheryl. For the first time in more than 20 years, Fort Lee security is at an all-time high. Threat condition delta in military terms. In simple language, it means every ID checked and every card stopped and checked thoroughly. Attack on America. This is News 6 Network continuing coverage. Gates are closed and traffic at a standstill going into Fort Lee. The only quick way in is on Prince George County school buses, which are allowed a police escort to make getting children back home as quickly as possible. Only essential personnel working, everyone else told they could leave. We're not in a, in a crisis. We're simply increasing our security. We're providing the very best uh, that we can to those that work on Fort Lee and live on Fort Lee. No, I'm not under this threat condition, security is high and tight. We're having a 100% identification check, and that means that every car that's coming into the installation is being checked, uh, the identification of the driver and the car itself. Fort Lee Military Police and the Virginia State Police will continue to work together to keep traffic flowing, going on to and in front of the base. But for those stuck in traffic, the wait is understood. Oh, I think after what happened this morning, I think taking precautions like this is absolutely necessary. And yeah, it's, it's very inconvenient waiting an hour with a small child, but um, I think you've got to do what you've got to do until we know more, I guess. Now, Fort Lee can't say at this point how long it will remain on this highest threat condition, but they do ask this of the public. They say if you're not essential personnel, if you don't really need to go to Fort Lee to wait at least several days and not go on post, they hope by doing this they'll alleviate some of the congestion at the gates that are open because several of the gates are closed and will remain closed until this Delta threat is changed. Ray and Cheryl. Now, Wayne, as you know, they, they have mobilized military all across the country now. The Virginia Air National Guard has been called out. You were on the military base today. What has the mood been there? Are people talking about having to possibly go into active duty? There's, there's been no word right now that anyone from Fort Lee will be called up into any type of service at this time. We do know that they have a rather large military police personnel there, but at this point, no word if anybody will go on, to, will leave the post to go into any of these areas that have been hit by this attack. We talk a lot about mood in, on a day like this, and it, it's very difficult sometimes to put the feelings into words. What were people saying to you there? Well, I think a, a little bit like Greg McQuaid said, everybody just feels lucky about that, that their loved ones hadn't been hurt by this. But also in the same respect, they say waiting in traffic, you know, for an hour, the young lady you saw there had a small child. She said an hour is very little to pay in terms of what has happened in this country. They understand when you're related to the military, having covered the military for 14 years, when you're related to the military, when something like this happens, they understand exactly what's going on. They understand that, you know, their role as a spouse is, to, you know, to to pray for and be there for their other spouse who's in the military. And so they all understand that at a moment's notice, some of these yeah. people may be leaving. And one thing about military families and that military community, Wayne, is that everyone, that's a tight-knit group. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because anytime you have a situation like this, Stephanie, what happens is their lives are on the line again, and I saw it during Desert Storm, I've seen it in deployments here at Fort Lee, that it becomes even tighter than it is. It's a unique group of people that do a unique service to this country. A lot of times they're underrated, but in times like these, you're glad you have the U.S. military. All right, thank you. Wayne Colville reporting live from our Tri-Cities Bureau in Petersburg. And... Uh, Almost as disturbing as the tragedies themselves today was the reaction that the Palestinians had to the attacks. There were celebrations at Jerusalem's Damascus Gate after the Palestinians heard of the attacks. The U.S. government is unpopular with Palestinians who accused American officials of siding with the Israels. Talking to uh, Dr. Hill from VCU some more, and you just touched on an interesting point, Doctor, that. Uh, you mentioned the Kennedy assassination in November of 63. It's hard to compare to tragic events, but did you feel that there are some similar similarities as far as we as humans react? Well, I think there will be in terms of the mark that this makes on our psyche as a nation. Uh, this will be one of those events that you'll be able to remember a lot of little details about what's called flashbulb memory um, because of the trauma 
you were, associated with. You recall exactly where you were and who you were with or who you weren't with when you heard the news. Yes. About a dozen events like that during our lifetime, so this is one of them. This will be one of them, for sure. There's been so many uh, uh, tragedies during our lifetimes. Let's take Oklahoma City, for example, the bombing there. Somehow, throughout the day, we could comprehend that this one entirely boggles the mind. This is just be off the radar. Well, I think part of it is the way in which the targets were chosen. You know, they were chosen to be symbols of America that we all relate to. And so, therefore, we're much more invested in the Pentagon and in the World Trade Center than we were in, a, in the office building in Oklahoma. Uh, so it's hitting us kind of closer to our heart. We were talking also about uh, the emotions we go through as humans, and I think today just qualifies as being numb. It's hard to, to feel a lot of anger yet. We're still in the numbing stage. Right. And there will be a lot of grief, uh, a lot of human tragedy, and there will be emotions like fear and uncertainty, uh, those kinds of things. And it's those kinds of things that we can really do something about a little bit more. I mean, it's natural to feel the grief. We should let ourselves grieve. But we can also help to make sure that we're not adding to the anxiety that we're feeling right now and not adding to the fear. Well, I've heard the phrase several times today that our lives have changed as of today. Is that overstating things or is that pretty accurate? Well, it, it'll be changed in the sense we might not be as naive about our vulnerability as we were before. Uh, we can recover from things, though. Human beings are extremely resilient and we have the ability to bounce back. So. I'm definitely optimistic on that level. I don't think this has to be a point where we don't recover from, that we can bounce back, we can learn how to deal with situations like this and hopefully uh, come up with the kinds of protections that we need internally. Uh, you can never protect yourself against a person who's willing to sacrifice their lives with a bomb, uh, but we can start to protect ourselves in terms of our own internal environment to build up our own inner resources. Referring back to Oklahoma City, eventually a, uh, a suspect and then a convict emerged with uh, Tim McVeigh, and we had someone to focus our uh, disappointment at, to, right. put it, to put it mildly. Oftentimes with terroristic cases, if that's indeed what it was today, and all appearances are that it is so far, is it harder for us to comprehend an act like this when we have no one to pin it on? It is, and also there's a, a danger of rushing to judgment and of condemning, say, a whole people. Uh, for example, in the news, a lot of times there have been um, many pictures of Palestinian celebration, not as many pictures of Chairman uh, Arafat, who truly was touched, uh, you know, condemning the bombing. And I think we need to have that kind of balance in terms of our reactions, because this is a time when prejudice and uh, you know, the, the kind of negative human emotions do tend to show their face, unfortunately. I know you're not a social scientist, but let me put you on the spot. Do you think today will change the... Uh, the U.S. outlook toward other countries will become more isolationist, or do you have any predictions in your crystal ball how this might change our psyches as Americans? Well, I, I don't in terms of our reaction to other countries. Uh, as I said, I'm an optimist in terms of our psyche. I think our psyche is very resilient. I think we will recover, and I think we grow from these experiences uh, for the good, eventually. And closing advice for our viewers about how to uh, move forward from this? I think there are a lot of things we can do in terms of our own anxiety and stress and stress reduction techniques like relaxation, meditation, deep breathing are very beneficial. Okay. Thanks for your time, Dr. Hill. My pleasure. All right, Stephanie.